funny, and right now she's a famous author. I'm sure somebody else will know her name. But she wrote a book called The Bluest Eye. Toni Morris. That book is one of the most powerful arguments for that. And I had friends in, in uh, Texas when I was working in the library, and this one woman made her own clothes, and she always looked perfect, and she was gorgeous. And I walked up to her one day, I said, did you know that you're really beautiful? And she looked at me like she was shocked. I thought it never occurred to her. And that was my first time that I realized how, you know, how, how that works. How, you know, got a, a feeling for it because I'm kind of neutral. Mm -hmm. It's hard to tell who or what I am. <laughs> Were you saying she used a lot of makeup? Or what? No, she, she didn't use a lot of makeup. She didn't try not to look like herself. But she was very conscious of style and the clothes oh, yeah. she made for herself were gorgeous and she walked with pride. You know, and she she had a lot she was very intelligent and sophisticated. Mm -hmm. But she didn't have that confidence that she would in mm -hmm. herself that she was beautiful. Well, a couple of things beat me off there. Um, one, she, she's a woman writing that, and she doesn't know people are, are doing evaluations. They're just not saying it's due to her race. They're saying it's due to her gender. Thank you. But yes. then um, also, <laughs> it was funny because if, if I walk up to a woman and tell her she's beautiful, she gets pissed off at me. So I, I get pissed off about that. <laughs> Well, yeah, they don't want to be known for their beauty. Yeah, exactly. But this was in the early 70s. Oh, yeah, I could have gotten away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone, oh, did you want to say something? Well, um, okay. I was going to try and say something about aesthetics. So um, it's interesting that people are making comments about aesthetic appearance. And um, I think that... Uh, uh, that we're at a level, when we're at that level, we're on a level of, um, in a way, the subconscious, um, the way things affect us at a deep level, at a pre-reflective level. And um, I was going to say that I think that that's an important sort of goal for us to um, have a conversation with our um, uh, pre-reflective mind, sort of like the, our unconscious in a way. And part of what we want to do is... Um, I think is um, but sort of become more aware of what we unconsciously endorse or how we unconsciously affect other people, which is a very difficult thing, I think. But it, but I don't know. I just uh, the idea of talking of, of changing the way you act with regards to privilege is to change something that is um, not conscious to the mind. It's something that we take for granted. So we're sort of trying to take the eyeball out of our head and turn it back around and look at ourselves, and it's a difficult thing. Right here first. Oh, thank you. Sorry, my, my shoulders popped out of the place a little time. Yes, I, I have a little pain raising my arm. Okay. However, <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I learned about white privilege just recently, and it, it, this, the thought didn't strike me how privileged I actually am uh, as, as a Caucasian male, predominantly a, a male, until I went and applied for a job. Um, I, I've been out of work for a couple months now, and uh, I thought, well, why don't I go over to the YMCA, because I have a bachelor's degree and I want to flip burgers. Nothing against burger flippers or dishwashers, I just don't want to do it. I don't think, I'm, I don't think my four-year degree, you know... It won't pay for your loans, put it that no, way. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly, it will not pay for my loans, so nothing against uh, the good working class people or as Marx calls them, the proletariat. But when I went to the uh, the YMCA, I, I said, well, let me see if they're hiring. So I went there, and immediately I, I was dressed exactly like this. I did not shave. I did not comb my hair. I didn't wear a suit. I didn't wear a golf shirt, nothing like that. And I just went exactly how I am, and I, and I said, let me be as polite as possible. And I said, are you guys hiring? She said, yeah. And the first word out of her mouth was, yes, we are. <laughs> Yeah. First word out of her mouth is yes. We are. Come to find out, I'm even more privileged because I knew the director, uh, the one one of the ladies on the board. I played hockey with her son. So not only am I privileged as a Caucasian male, but there's nepotism involved, and that really bothers me because I feel that if one of my friends from special education, going years back, had <coughs> applied for the same position in their uh, casual attire, I don't believe they would have had the same outcome 
as myself, but I'm, I might be judging the woman at the desk. I don't know. But it's possible. There have been studies done on... on <laughs> I'm sorry, did, did someone have their hand up? Uh, I did. I can wait. I, oh, you definitely did. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll hold that thought. Sure. I was just going to add to what he said. It's fine. Go ahead. Uh, one thing I think, a way that privilege plays out, particularly white privilege in this movement, and it was apparent to me from the beginning, it was apparent to a lot of people from the beginning, and I think it's probably still an issue around the nation and possibly around the world uh, today, is uh, a bunch of people showed up and were just like, okay, we're sick and tired of these conditions and we're just going to like protest and we're just going to stay here. And they had this expectation that that would be okay, that they felt confident enough that their tactics would be recognized and would succeed. And uh, they were just like, oh yeah, we need more people to represent the 99%, so just come on out and do what we're doing. Expecting that everybody else would have the same level of confidence, the same level of awareness, that the same expectation that their tactics would work. And... Um, it, it became really clear. There was a wonderful conversation. I really thank this woman, Joan. She was involved for a little while uh, for pointing it out to some of the people who aren't as aware that it doesn't work that way. That, you know, you can just show up on a street corner and protest and just, you know, wait for the news to show up or whatever. Some people would do that and instantly be surrounded by police and potentially violently attacked or arrested. Right. And it just really highlighted white privilege in this entire movement that. People have felt, you know, economically oppressed and, and politically oppressed for so long, but they have to come up with tactics that work for them in a racist institution, in a racist system. And I think a lot of people were unaware at the beginning, and there's still probably a lot of people unaware um, that how the Occupy movement has developed and the tactics that we've adopted and whatnot are largely coming from a privileged background, that they're not going to be applicable across the board, and that there are people who are afraid of violent police repression uh, that uh, and that's why it was so striking to America when those white kids at UC Davis got pepper sprayed for really not doing anything when that happens in communities of color fairly often and I just think that we're just going to like it. are you going to make that point in response to Michael or yes. should we go to other speakers you guys um I don't even feel like you should be raising your hands. Let's just go in a circle. I feel bad calling out people. Go ahead. Orlin? I, 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 have to, I, I have to say this. Mm -hmm. Probably the best, the absolute best example of white privilege I've ever come across in my life is in this tent. Mm -hmm. How dare we sit here and say, you know... Occupy is really working in it because it's a bunch of white people got together and we're using our tactics and that's why everything is doing so well and you know those other people including those other people of color you know they're going to have to find their own tactics because you know we have ours and that's really okay what I would hope people would know at the absolute surface level if nothing else these are not our tactics the two people that we talk about most whenever we talk about going forward in this movement are Gandhi yeah. and Martin Luther King. And the last time I looked, neither of those dudes were white. <laughs> Number one. Number two. But there's something that goes back with it, too. And this is the other part, I think, of privilege. We were talking about this a little bit earlier. The notion that white people get it on both sides. Yeah, we know we have the privilege and we have this, but, you know, we know what's down in the hood. So we know that no matter what else is going on and what other things, no, dudes can't go walk the streets in the, in, in the hood because there's cops out there trolling for them and they're going to beat them up and, and round them all up. Right. That every time a black family goes to the mall, the first thing that's going to happen is security is going to be called. Now, do I think these things still happen? Oh, yeah. Do I think they are the norm now? No. And for one very simple reason. Now, and again... Might in, the, in the suburbs, in most urban areas, what we have are police forces that are made up of African American officers and commanders, Hispanic officers, Samoan officers. So you think that this whole thing of just go out and round them up still is the norm? Yeah. What? Yeah. It depends. Yeah. Absolutely it depends, it depends on where you live. I come from Texas, and, and uh, it's, uh, 
real interesting to see. However, <laughs> however, I think part of unpacking this and having this dialogue is getting rid of all the wrong stereotypes. Okay? Um, it, that, there's that. My other part of it, too, is it's great to talk about aesthetics. I'd like to open up what I think are, are the two biggest things that divide us, being the white folks, from the people of color. And that's the fact that so many of you men are here instead of in prison. And that the other thing that you can count on is that more people of color have their children taken away from them daily for things that most white people never become issues. However, the further argument with that, and this is also one of the things that I think has to be put in the mix when we talk about race and how people are perceived and treated in this country, is that probably one of the most important things in the last 25 years is not so much that people of color have made strides, but this is not, this is in not simply being a color issue, it has absolutely become a class issue. Class. Because where it could be said that this was simply black and white or brown and white, it is an absolute all-out assault on poor people. Yeah, yeah it was like that remark Romney made. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, what did he say? Uh, what did he say? Oh, Romney made some remark about, about what was it? What about the, the food stamp president? What about the one where he said he didn't make much money last year, only no, 325000 it had thousand. something to do with race. It was very racist. I forget what it was. And also, of course, there's uh, New Kingdom. Yeah, well, have them have, like, them have jobs job instead of, of giving them school. money. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's what I was trying to think. Instead of giving them I've been on food stamps, you know, and, and I don't know what. Last time so, I folks, started, if I oh. could... Um, we, uh, the Jasenka suggested that we just go around the room. So, um, uh, Jackie, did you want to? Uh, no, not at this moment. There's okay. a lot of things bouncing around my head. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't, oh, can I ahead. say one thing? Yeah, you were ahead. just talking about um, Angela Davis's Women, Race, and Class, like, when was that? 30, 40 years ago was the book that really. World. 80? 40, 40. Yeah. Um, that thing's open to me when I realized. The numbers, the population of slaves in the South, and how they didn't, of course, you were kept from not learning reading, writing, or getting together with other people, didn't know you could just rise up and <laughs> whoop their asses, you know, by just uh, unawareness. And the class, that's what brought me to that, is that uh, now people are starting to talk about class, but it was so, uh, you know, against the rules for a long time, and it all that women race class all tied right in together. Yeah, so that's all.